All right. So I'm happy to see everyone here, or I'm glad you can see me. Welcome to JMC's, uh, the Jack Miller Center's first webinar ever in these trying times. What good is federalism in a pandemic? Tried to make a provocative title in order to anger and confound people. Uh, so hopefully we'll have a good discussion and some good questions from you all. Um, do you want to say, just quickly say hi, John and Ben? Make sure your audio is working. Hi, this is John Diamond. <laughs> hi, this is Ben Kleinerman. All right, and I'll give them a, a proper introduction in a second. Um, let me first say a couple of things about the Jack Miller Center. A lot of you I know know us already. You've been to our summer institutes or to a Lincoln Symposium or you've been a, a, par a partner program director or we, you put on a speaker series or you've been a speaker at a Constitution Day event or you've attended a Constitution Day event. And we, like a lot of people, um, have, cannot put on any events right now. Uh, but we're trying to keep engaged with you all. Um, we're sad that we're not gonna have a summer institute as we had planned, but hopefully we'll keep in touch at least in this way and other ways. So keep on the lookout for more of this. I'm gonna say a couple of words um, first, just about the format of this conversation. Uh, we wanna try to make it interactive. So for example, I'm gonna put up a poll about our topic and you guys can answer it and hopefully it'll provide some fodder for discussion. Namely, who do you trust more in dealing with a pandemic, the federal government or the state government? And uh, once you guys answer that, it, uh, we'll, we'll post the results and we'll, we'll see what you think after the discussion as well. Um, you, some of you already sent in questions and uh, Ben and uh, John have seen them already, and uh, they're going to try to incorporate some of those questions into their discussion. You can also send in questions using the Q&A function, which is in the uh, Zoom men menu. So if you're on a computer using the computer application, it should be at the bottom of your Zoom window. You can send those questions in. I'll be monitoring those questions during the discussion, and I'll uh, introduce them to our speakers uh, about 35 minutes into the discussion. Um, so please send us a bunch of questions. Uh, we we want to hear from you. Um, I'll say a couple of words about Ben Kleinerman and uh, John Dynan. Uh, ben has a uh, Professor Kleinerman has a long history with uh, Jack Miller Center. I think you were at maybe the first Jack Miller Center Summer Institute, is that right? Hmm. Or no? First one. First, first one? one? Oh, wow. no. so he's an oldie but goodie, uh, and we've made him the man he is today. No, <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, he's been teaching at MSU for a long time at the James Madison College, but he's about to start or has started as the R.W. Morrison Chair of Political Science at Baylor University. He knows a lot about uh, executive power, a lot about Lincoln. Um, he's got this book, The Discretionary President, which uh, I don't know if I've told him before, is my favorite book on the executive. Uh, so you've got that, he's got that going for him as well. Uh, he's also on the board of the Jack Miller Center. Um, so he's a good friend. Uh, John Dynan, Professor Dynan, He's professor of politics at Wake Forest University. I know he's been involved in our programming in the past. Uh, and he's an expert on uh, federalism, right? So it'd be hard to find someone more equipped to answer these questions than this man. Uh, he's the author of several books, State Constitutional Politics, Governing by Amendment in the American States, The American State Constitutional Tradition. And he is the editor of Publius, which is the journal about federalism. So I, I challenge you to find someone that can speak more knowledgeably about federalism. Um, so I'm, what I'm gonna do is I'm going to share the results of this poll and then I'm gonna turn it over directly to John to make a few remarks before the conversation. 
or let me just say one more word. It looks like 83% uh, of our participants prefer the state government or trust the state government more than the federal government. So that's an interesting fact, but I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Tom, thanks so much and, and thanks for this opportunity. I just wanna make a few minutes of remarks and then we'll get into a discussion with Ben. And just, I wanna start by saying, I have long thought that we do not pay enough attention to state government and state politics in ruling, in journalistic treatment, in the media. I've always thought that state politics doesn't get the attention that deserves. And in following the reaction of the coronavirus pandemic, I've only been led to be further confirmed in this view that in fact, actually state politics and our failure to pay more attention to state politics has actually hindered our understanding of American politics. Let me just say three quick reasons why, and then we can get into a discussion. The first way in which our failure to pay more attention to state politics has hindered us is it hasn't fully prepared us for and has led us to be surprised by the prominent role played by state governors and other state officials in responding to the virus. My first claim is, is that we shouldn't be all that surprised by. It shouldn't come as, as something that we weren't expected to see governors being the key actors. That is in some ways the natural state of American politics and it is the usual response to disasters. Many folks have been surprised by that. They've taken that as in some ways a failure of the system or something wrong with the system or a compensation for something that needs to be compensated for in the system. But if we'd been properly state politics in the past and seen their role in the US federal system, we would be as surprised as many people are surprised. That's the first point that I want to hope we'll discuss. A second point that I think we'll discuss in part because we haven't paid attention to state politics, we haven't had attention to look at exactly how powerful state governments really are, and in particular, how powerful state governors are. This might be the first time a lot of people have actually taken note. You mean, some people say, a state governor can tell me that I have to stay in my house? A state governor can tell me I can't travel outside my house? A governor of a state can tell me I have to shut down my business, that I can't actually go to a restaurant. And so this is an occasion to do something that we haven't done enough of in the past, to actually look at the power of state governments and the power in particular of state governors in emergencies. They are quite powerful. And this virus has given us an opportunity to really dust off these statute books and really delve into this. Where do these state governors get their power from? And what are the limits, if any, to those powers? And then a third point, more briefly, to the extent that we have paid attention to state politics and state governments, it's usually in relation to the federal government. We think of balance between state and federal governments, conflicts between state and federal governments. And yet the coronavirus and the response has led us to take note of some of the more fiercer conflicts or actually sometimes between state governors and local governments. In fact, the conflict between what a state government can do and what counties or cities and local officials can do within a state government has been quite prominent in response to the virus. And we're now only now turning our attention to that in some cases and saying, who has the upper hand in these state local battles? These are just three of the topics that I think have been uh, brought to mind by the coronavirus pandemic and the response and that I hope we'll discuss today. Uh, ben, let me throw it over to you. Thank you. Thanks, John. I'm mostly going to be, I'm not an expert like John is, so I'm mostly going to be asking questions of John so he can speak about it rather than, because he's the real expert in, in these fields. Um, so I think I want to start with the most, I'm going to ask John the most, in a way, the most interesting question, to me at least. It's almost always the case that presidents consolidate power in crises. In fact, you know, especially given the way people talk about President Trump, you'd think he would consolidate power in this crisis. But we haven't seen that. Instead, as much as anything, we've seen a devolvement of power to the states away from the federal government. And in fact, the complaint has been the federal government is 
isn't exercising enough power rather than that it's exercising too much. So I think in a way that's a really unique character of this crisis, whereas 9-11 or the um, Great Recession, various other crises we've had in the past, presidents have assumed a lot more power at the expense of Congress and even in a way at the expense of the states. In this case, you've seen a development of power to the, to the, to the states. So I wonder, is that unique to this administration or is that unique to this crisis? What do you, what do you think? Is, what's the, is it because of the nature of this crisis that we're seeing more power exercise at the state level or is that just this administration? Yeah, you know, I, I think that's a great place to start. Let me, um, I think there's several explanations that I would start us off with. That is why th there's a broad expectation that you get a crisis that the federal government has been assumed power president and student power within the federal government, that generally hasn't happened so much here. Why not? I think the first explanation is, is the disaster response, the more that we look into this, the natural way the disaster response is set up is that states are the primary actors and the federal government provides assistance, backup, and support. That's in many ways the way that the system is set up. And so as accustomed to as we are to looking at a first instance for a national government and a president to take action, that's actually more in keeping with disaster response for state governors, state governments to be the key actors. So in some ways, this is just in keeping with the tradition that we see today. But I think there's two other explanations because a president always has some discretion. That might be the tradition, that might be the general way things are done. The president has, always has some element of choice. And President Trump could have exercised that choice to a greater degree of centralization and has not done so. And so the question naturally arises, why not? Given this element, a range of choice or discretion, what would have stayed the president's hand? I think two things. One is, in a way, the president wanted to actually centralize and exercise more power. There's a famous statement where he said, I have total authority to do what I want in that sense. So there was a, there was a reaching in some ways to, to claim that power. And yet what stayed that, what led that to, to, to kind of not take place, it ran up against the unalterable fact that actually the president did not have as much power as state governments in key ways. The president found out he did not have the power to actually tell states to shut down or to open up. Only a governor of a state could tell schools in that state to shut down or tell schools to reopen. And so part of what stayed the president's hand was a realization that he actually didn't have the power to do things in this particular way. And then I think a final thing that explains why President Trump in this particular instance has not moved to centralize power more and has deferred to states is in some ways because this particular virus has hit the 50 states in dramatically different levels of seriousness. One way of thinking about this is if New York and New Jersey were separate countries, and if we were looking at the data on uh, fatality rates per million people in the population, New York and New Jersey would have far worse fatality rates than even countries such as Spain or Italy, which are some of the most hardest hit, hit countries. Or suppose California, Texas, Florida, and North Carolina were separate countries, and we put, that, put them up against other countries, their fatality rate because of the virus per million would be even more favorable than countries such as Germany, which have been seen as doing relatively well. And so when you look at this, you have a range of states such as New York, New Jersey on one hand, and the other states such as Florida, Texas, North Carolina on the other hand, and you see the vastly different effect of the virus. In some ways, the president's decision to defer to states is a recognition that different situations call for different solutions depending on the state. Yeah, I wonder then, that actually leads to a sort of normative question that I think has to be asked. That is, is it better that this is being solved at the state level than at the national level, which would be preferable, you think, on, on balance, you know, and then maybe there's specific things that would be preferably done at the national level versus the state level. But I wonder what you think, which, is it better that it's being solved mostly at the state level? 
I mean, this is this is a key question, of course, and, and this is going to be a question that's going to give rise over the next few months and years to all kinds of quantitative analysis. <laughs> say, look, let's take a look at the various federal systems around the world, about 20 countries that are designated as truly federal countries. South America, we have countries such as Brazil, Argentina. In Europe, we have countries such as Germany, Switzerland, Austria, Belgium. In Africa, we have countries such as Nigeria, South Africa, Ethiopia. And so one of the things that we'll have scholars do is we'll actually see to what extent when we take a federal system components and compare those against unitary countries, will, what will be the performance of federal systems compared with non-federal systems? We can even throw in what we call quasi-federal systems as well, such as Spain or Italy which aren't truly federal, they aren't truly unitary. Well, these will be difficult analysis because we, we, can, we can get our numbers out there, but then people say, well, you have to take account of the age of the population or the different density of the population or other factors. And still, that, that would be worth doing and we'll see to what extent do federal systems perform better at managing and responding to the virus than some non-federal systems. Well, that's one way to come at it in a quantitative fashion, and there will be some scholars that pursue that. But then there's another way to come at it, and that is to kind of think, okay, what are the, what are the various pur purported virtues of a decentralized federal system? And what are the various purported disadvantages? And which of those seem to apply in the case of the virus response? Let me just run through quickly how we might think about this, and then we can, we can react to this. So what are, the, what are three main reasons why we might think that a federal system such as the US is not well positioned to respond effectively to the virus? Well, one concern is about coordination problems. You may say, look, a federal system that devolves a lot of power to the states, it's gonna naturally have a lot of coordination problems of coordinating the federal state. It's gonna create a lot of conflict in an unhelpful way. Well, is that present here? Yes, we can check that off. That is definitely a disadvantage of the federal system in sense here. Second potential disadvantage, this is even more serious. That is, in a federal system, you will have competition among the states. And that competition among states might be generally favorable when they're competing to have the best education system or the best business climate. But what if the competition isn't for businesses and good education, what if the competition is for a scarce resource such as ventilators or other masks that are in short supply? Their competition isn't a good thing, it's a bad thing. Is that present here? Yep, that is definitely present here. That would be seen as a disadvantage of a federal system in the case of the virus. And a third disadvantage, and this is perhaps the most serious of all in some ways, and this is the problem of accountability. Whenever you have a federal system, where power is shared among various levels. It's gonna be very difficult for voters to know who do I blame if things went wrong and who do I reward if things go right. Consider yourself a citizen of Salt Lake City or of New York City. Suppose you're happy with how things have gone. Suppose you're unhappy with how things are gone. Who do you reward or blame? Is it the mayor of your city that was responsible? Is it the governor of your state? Or is it the president? It's very difficult to sift through responsibility and assign accountability in that situation. So those would be three reasons why you might say a, a federal system such as the U.S. is not good at handling the virus. But let me though turn next briefly. What are three reasons though, on the other hand, where you might say actually a federal system is very well positioned to kind of respond to the virus. These traditional virtues of a federal system are very much realized in this case. Three reasons. One, you might say a classic argument for a federal system is you can tailor policy differently to differently situated regions of the country. Is that present in the case of the virus? Most clearly it is. In fact, there's two states that never closed their school systems. The other 48 states have done so in some respects. That'd be a virtue of the federal system in response. A second virtue would be you're able to be more nimble in response. It's tough to turn the federal government around, even get it started on a policy or change a policy. Much easier for states to change on a dime as needed, as we've seen in the virus. And a third and final, and this is perhaps the most valuable virtue of all of a federal system responding to viruses, the virtues of innovation and in policy 
and learning from various experiments. Just look at the way here that certain states shut down early, other states waited to see how is those shuts down working. Other states said, let's reopen early. And other states said, let's see how that goes before we actually take our own steps. In short, um, I, I, don't, I don't come here to say that uh, uh, one side of that balance is clearly stronger than the other. I do say that some of the disadvantages that are traditionally seen of federalism are present here, but some of the virtues of a federal system are also very much present, not only in ordinary times, but also in responding to the coronavirus. I wonder if the, so you mentioned the coordination problems of, in terms of ventilators and masks. I wonder if that's, because it doesn't strike me that that's a necessary defect of a federal system. It's in some ways, a federal system makes possible both the virtues of state control and the virtues of national control. You know, the sort of interstate commerce makes possible a federal government regulating certain things that need to be regulated at the federal level. So I wonder if, I mean, is that really a necessary component of this, or is that a sort of accident of, of a failure at the national level? What do you, what do you think? I mean, one way of thinking this through this is, is any federal system can, can assign powers in different levels to the federal government state government. That is, when I said there's about 28 federal systems around the world, those federal systems vary greatly amongst themselves. Some can really give a lot of power to the center and not much to the periphery. Other countries, such as the US, Canada, can give a lot of power to the peripheral states and, and not as much power to the national government. And one way of thinking through this is how has the, has the federal, how has the US federal system allocated its powers? In terms of responding to a virus, you would have to say that federal power is actually relatively limited. What is the federal government able to do in responding to a virus in the US? It can, on the one hand, restrict entry into the country. That's clearly a power of the federal government. And was that exercised here? Yes, to bar tr travel from China, then from Europe. What else can the federal government do in the US federal system? Well, it has limited power, very limited power of quarantine. It can prevent people with infectious diseases from traveling across state lines. So that's again, something you could do that the federal government has the power to do. Other than that, what else can the federal government do? Well, it can provide a lot of funding to help with research and help states make up with things. And then we have this Defense Production Act, the Korean War era law that does allow the president, but not state governors, to actually order companies to actually mobilize and pick up production, such as their ventilators and masks. And so one of the concerns that people would have here, and clearly much of the debate has been, has President Trump use this Defense Production Act to the greatest possible extent, or has been, he been more minimal in using that? Some people have, have raised the argument that if the president had been more aggressive in using this, he could have avoided some of the coordination problems that states have found, where they say, I'm competing against other states for these scarce ventilators. Why, if only the president had taken upon himself to order certain companies to make more of these. I think that's where the coordination and conflict problem and competition problem has come in, in the case of the virus. Ben, I'm not hearing you. Um, I mute, sorry. I wanna veer into history some because I think much of the debate right now at the, throughout the country has been, are these shelter in place orders sort of entirely new or is there a history of them? So one of the participants in this, webinar asked, John, John Mueller asks, quote, contagious infections were frequent in colonial times. Which level of government would, did most assume was appropriate to respond? And relatedly, have states generally done this before? Is there a history of quarantine? Is there a history of this kind of state control in response to health crises like yeah. this? Yeah, I mean, dealing with infectious diseases has long been one of the primary concerns of local governments and state governments in the U.S. It's what we say is a classic example of the state police power. That is, it's the power of state governments to look out for the health of their citizenry. And so a significant, to, to we might not appreciate today, a significant amount of state and local government 
power was exercised in response to infectious diseases that would crop up occasionally. In fact, state and local power was exercised to such a great extent that it gave rise to one of the leading Supreme Court cases that we still see discussed today. This is the case of Jacobson versus Massachusetts, which was a 1905 case. And it's worth just spending a minute on this case because it gets at this question that was asked. So the Jacobson v. Massachusetts case concerned a Massachusetts law that allowed for mandatory vaccination of all individuals in cases where that was required. That was challenged when Cambridge, Massachusetts decided that in the case of a smallpox outbreak, that everybody must, pursuant to the state law, be vaccinated or pay a fine. Uh, an individual said, I'm not willing to do that. I'm challenging that. It went all the way up to the US Supreme Court. And in the case of Jacobson versus Massachusetts in 1905, the US Supreme Court set down a decision, which is still seen as valid case law today, still referred to a lot, and the Supreme Court said that is a classic example of state governing power. In times of a health crisis, if a state or a locality determines that steps such as vaccination, mandatory vaccination, are required for the health of the citizenry, that state or locality can require it to be done, and that is no violation of someone's federal constitutional rights. As I say, that it maintains valid law. And looking at that case, just as a reminder of how deep-seated this state tradition of taking pretty significant action in response to health crisis is, and how courts have been willing to defer to this state police power, even in the face of some pretty significant legal challenges. So I wonder, because I've been struck as much by the federal state level, there's the kind of dynamic of the federal state level, and then we also have the local state level. So as you have three levels really going on here. Sometimes local government are doing things independently of states or in, contra in over and against what their states want to do or more intensely or less intensely shelter in place. So I wonder if you could speak some of, about that dynamic of this crisis. It, it, does it replicate some of the same advantages of state versus federal power or you know, how would you characterize that dynamic? I mean, we've had a lot of occasions in response to the coronavirus, to, as I say, to dust off some of these old statute books and say, <laughs> how do we resolve these kind of questions? And, and first, first occasion we've had is to take a look at these state emergency power statutes. I don't, I didn't have a whole lot of occasion before the last few months to take a look at North Carolina or Virginia or other states to say what powers does a governor have in terms of a, of a, of a health crisis. It turns out there are quite significant authority granted in state statutes. Some of these come from constitutions of the states, but for the vast majority, it comes from the state statutes. Very detailed and essentially says a governor, in many cases, a governor alone has the ability to declare a health emergency and then to issue quarantine orders, to shut down businesses. Now, some states say, well, it's not only the power of the governor. Governor can do that for only 30 days and then would have to get the support of a legislature. But in many cases, it's simply the governor alone has that power. So our first uh, realization has been, this is significant power of, 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 of state government. And again, the federal government has none of that power. President Trump has no power to order the shutdown of a business or school or tell people they've got to be quarantined. That state governors do have that power. But then relatedly, as you mentioned, we've not only had to take a look at these statute books and say, what is this tremendous power that state governors, that the governor has the power to tell me I have to stay in my house. We've taken a chance. Well, what happens if a city in a state says, I, I, I want to go further than the governor's ordered, or I want to go not as far as the governor's ordered? What's the rules on that? And we've had a chance to dust off what we call various home rule statutes. Home rule allows localities to actually have some independence of governing and, go and govern differently from the state. It turns out that the answer to the question that you raise about what power a locality in a state has to differ from the state depends on whether that state is a home rule state where state localities could act independently or whether it's called a Dillon's rule state where they're actually just a creature of the state government and would have to do the state government's bidding. And so what we see is we've seen a range of outcomes here. We see in Texas where we had the state governor of Texas say, state time to open up, here's the rules. 
Some cities in Texas say, we're not ready to open up yet. We'd like to actually have some stronger restrictions for a while. The governor of Texas was entirely allowed under Texas rules to say, I'm sorry, localities, you're preempted. You're living under the state rules. You've got to abide by uniform rules. But other states, which had a different arrangement, the governor said, uh, I want to uh, open up the state as a whole, but localities, you have the discretion if you want to, to maintain stricter rules, and you can maintain those stricter rules for longer than, than, than I'm doing so. That's allowed in these other states. And so you do have some states where the state as a whole has opened up, and yet various localities have said, we're actually uh, not going along with that. Now, there's been a lot of um, conflict and in some ways uncertainty about some of this, but the main point here is, is that the power of cities or counties to take on those things differs widely depending on whether or not you're a home rule state or you're not. So I wonder, what do you think the legacy of this will be? The institutional legacy, will there be a kind of long, what follows from this? Maybe in terms of federal state relations, in terms of state local relations, is this going to set some kind of new standard? What do you think? And this is a big question, so. It is a big question. And, and, I'm, and I, I've been helped and aided in my, in my thinking about this question by, by, by two scholars in, in particular. One is Chris Demuth and the other is Michael Grieve. And so let me make a nod to, to both of them in, in helping me and others think through this. Um, Chris Demuth uh, wrote, wrote a Wall Street Journal piece uh, some time ago where he said what's, what most struck him about this is he said that he said that crises are usually opportunities, as, as you mentioned at the start of this conversation. Whenever we see a crisis, usually whether it be a, a, a foreign policy crisis or an economic recession or a terrorist attack, we usually see that have a legacy of shifting power from state governments to increasing the power of the federal government and oftentimes leaving an institutional legacy. Just think back to kind of the last few decades, the the September 11th terrorist attacks led to the creation of the Department of Homeland Security, led to the passage of the Patriot Act. And so we can see institutional legacies that were left by those 9-11 attacks. Or think to the Great Recession of 2007, 2008, uh, led to the creation of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau and various other institutions that go forward. What Demuth noted in, in, in his Wall Street Journal piece that I found uh, particularly striking is he said, we're not yet on track to see any institutional legacy of that kind in the case of responding to the virus. That is, we haven't yet seen any new major laws or institutions that would be enduring in a way to say, oh, that's a shift of power from the state to the federal government in responding to the virus. Now, perhaps it's too early to, 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 to make a judgment here. Let's wait a year or two on that case. But so far, nothing of the sort yet institutionally that we've seen that came from 9-11 or from the Great Recession. But, and here's where, let, let me turn to Michael Grieve. Michael Grieva said, well, um, maybe institutional legacy, maybe new departments or new agencies isn't where we want to look for legacy. Maybe where we want to be on the lookout for is new fiscal relationships, new financial arrangements between the state governments and the federal governments. And here the jury is still out. And let me say why. Right now, You've seen, you've seen several financial packages pass Congress so far to help out states. Uh, there could be more in, in, in coming. We'll talk about that in just a minute. So far, though, the pattern has been in keeping with prior patterns of responses, say, to the Great Recession or other financial difficulties that states have faced, where they basically, states will help you out with some money for Medicaid. States will help you out with some money for spending on K-12 through schools. States will help you out with some money, will make loans more accessible to you. If that's all that happens in response to the coronavirus, it probably wouldn't leave a major change in state federal fiscal relations. But, and here's where we're gonna pay particular attention to phase four, the upcoming phase four of the coronavirus stimulus. What happens if federal aid goes beyond that type of standard helping of states in times of crisis? What happens if the magnitude of federal aid becomes much larger 
or what happens if federal government starts helping out state governments, not just to help them out in the tough times of the next year or two, but actually starts helping them out with some of their pension obligations that are outstanding from, from, from years prior. And what if in exchange for saying, we're gonna help you out with some of your pension obligations, we're gonna put some strings on that and we're gonna make you beholden to certain policies that we have. If anything like that happens, that could pretty dramatically change the relationship between state and federal governments in terms of money. And why so? And I'll close here. If it's just the federal government saying, we're gonna help you out over some tough times for the next year or two, that probably doesn't change dramatically the state federal fiscal arrangements. If the federal government starts funding a significant amount of money for states, and if it starts then imposing conditions on that aid and making state governments beholden to the federal government, that could fundamentally alter what has up until now been a relatively independent state role in raising their finances and an independent federal role. If state governments start to see themselves as really dependent on and beholden to the federal government for significant parts of their treasury money, that could be a lasting institutional legacy. In short, to be determined is the reason why this next phase of the coronavirus relief package is probably the most important one for determining how significant of a change the virus response is as in terms of an enduring effect. Ben, I'm not hearing you. Sorry, uh, can you hear me now? <laughs> yes, okay. I think, do we have questions from the audience, Tom? Yeah, I could introduce some. Um, should we introduce, should we take some questions don't... now? What's that? Take some questions from the audience now? Yeah, you have some? Um, okay. So there's a question from, and maybe you addressed this already in a way, but uh, from Robinson Woodward Burns. You mentioned governors have broad emergency powers. You've also written broadly on state constitutional design. How do state constitutions structure governors' emergency powers? No, th thanks very much for that question. Always glad to talk about state constitutions. Always glad to talk about federalism. I'm particularly glad to talk about state constitutions. Um, so, so thank you for that. You know, um, let's start off by saying, look at the U.S. Constitution, and we say, what, where do you find the U.S. Constitution any discussion of emergency powers? Not much, actually. What you would find is the president has the executive power, and presidents have used that and say, well, that really gives me an emergency power. And then you find the ability to suspend habeas corpus, uh, which, which again, is, could be seen as emergency power of some kind. But note how that pales in comparison with so many other countries, which actually write in their constitution explicit emergency power of, of some mm -hmm. kind. So, so that's at the federal level. We don't see that much explicit. It's, it, it, emergency powers come from statutes or it's come through, through, through uh, the exercise of presidential power. What do things look like in state constitutions? Actually very similar. Not much, a little bit more, but not much in the way of explicit provision for emergency power. What, what do you find? A few states have emergency power provisions, but they're really limited to what happens if the legislature is not able to meet in time of a terrorist attack or a disaster. They say, oh, well, here's how the legislature could meet virtually. Or what, what happens if you're unable to, uh, uh, for, for a governor to succeed another governor because there's a crisis situation. Oh, here's how you have continuity of government. But actually, when we actually talk about the questions that we're most interested in here is in terms of ordering people to stay in their houses or ordering closure of businesses or preventing schools from opening up. That's not going to be found in the constitutions of the states. That's actually found in state statutes. And there's some pretty detailed state statutes that set out these emergency powers. And as I said at the very beginning, we haven't looked at these all that much. We just haven't had occasion to kind of say exactly how powerful all these emergency powers of, of the governors just hadn't had occasion to. Well, now people are having occasion to, and they're raising some questions about that. And in some cases, they're asking the question, have we given governors too much power to actually act in times of emergency? Perhaps governors shouldn't have to be only allowed to act alone, Perhaps the legislature or some council of state should have to con concur 
in the, in the governor's power. So we actually might see some amendments of state constitutions or some changes in state statutes as people who might be unhappy with the significant power that state governors have issued pursuant to these emergency statutes. But sometimes people are not just unhappy right now and say, I want to change the law or a constitution when we get through this. Sometimes people are going to court. And it's worth talk, taking note of some of the people who have actually challenged the state governor emergency declarations. And there's really two types of challenges that have taken place here. One is they've been broad-based challenges. People said, I just don't think the governor should have the power to tell me that my business has to shut down. I don't think a governor should have the power to tell me that I can't go out in public. Well, the leading example of a successful case of this kind has been in Wisconsin, where a challenge made its way to the Wisconsin Supreme Court and the Wisconsin Supreme Court, by a four to three decision, threw out a Democratic gubernatorial administration's authorities. I didn't give the party control there, but um, the four judges in Wisconsin Supreme Court were Republican allied judges. It was a Democratic administration, so we did have a situation there. But that was a case where the uh, four to three vote of the Wisconsin Supreme Court was, is that these particular orders didn't follow proper procedures. And so maybe if they followed proper procedures, they could have had that power, but they didn't follow proper procedures and they were struck down. And so Wisconsin is now in a situation where the state is opening up because of a legal challenge. There was another decision earlier this week by a lower court judge in Oregon who actually issued a similar decision he said, again, a, um, a Democratic gubernatorial administration had issued very shutdown orders. A lower court judge in Oregon said, uh, those cannot stand. I'm throwing those out, not because they didn't follow proper procedure. He said, look, the rule is clear. Governor can only issue an order of this kind for a limited time frame. And it, if the time frame gets extended, the legislature has to agree. I didn't see a legislative agreement. I'm throwing them out. Now that's been appealed and that's on stake. But so that's one type of case in which these gubernatorial uh, emergency power orders have been challenged and successful. The second type of case has been not a broad based challenge against gubernatorial executive emergency orders, but has been as they've been applied to particular institutions such as churches or abortion providers or gun shops. And here there has been some recent success particularly in regard to churches, both in North Carolina and in Kentucky and in several of the states. Litigants have challenged gubernatorial orders. Say, I'm not challenging them on a broad scale basis. I'm saying that what you have said in regard to churches in particular, requirements that they be limited to services of only 10 people, for instance, or requirements that they must be conducted outside services, not inside. I'm claiming, the litigants have said, that you're applying different rules to churches and religious services than you're applying to other organizations. Once again, litigants have been successful in several cases in actually winning their cases against governors and forcing governors to modify or withdraw these orders. So to, to wrap up this question, we're only just now paying a lot of attention to the state governor's emergency power uh, orders and their powers. Um, some people are struck by how strong they are. And some people are doing something going to court. And in some cases, they're winning. I, John, I just want to follow up that and then take another question. The, the church, because I haven't followed these, the church decisions, is that also a religious liberty? Have those been on the basis of religious liberties or has it all been differential treatment? Um, well, though the, they're, they're mixed in this way, and here's where they, they, they come together. The, the, the argument is in that way. Um, so in, in the cases where the litigants have been successful, a governor will say, um, okay, uh, uh, businesses, you can open up as long as you social distance, but you can open up to 50% capacity in that way. But churches, you can only open up maximum of 10 people. In that case, uh, uh, litigants have challenged and said, look, the, the religious liberty is so crucial that I, I believe that you're actually treating us differently in a way that suggests a violation of religious liberty in this case in a way that must be struck down. And that's the type of reasoning that the judges have usually given in reasoning their way through and saying, look, if you're treating this business this way and you're treating this church this different way, there's a problem and that you must actually treat them at least equally. 
Okay. So there hasn't been any religious liberties as such decisions. In other words, that the state can't regulate how religions, how people meet religiously. There's, they've all been differential questions. <laughs> Yes, I mean, we're, we're, we're still guided by largely here, and, and this is a, a moving, moving area of jurisprudence, but the general idea is if you have a generally applicable law that happens to apply to religious groups, and, and Hart said, that's okay. That was what the Oregon v. Smith decision said back in 1990. And so as long as governors are treating people the same, it's tough for the churches or other religious organizations to win. But once you see a case of a differential treatment, then we get into a different area of jurisprudence. So maybe you're targeting the churches or maybe you're intentionally treating them differently. And that's what opens up the opportunity for the religious litigants to have a chance of victory. Tom, do, you, or do we have more questions from Yeah, audience? we have more than enough questions. If there okay. was one you wanted to address that was sent beforehand, you could do that as well. But I can No, no, I, I think one of okay. you take another question. All right, so there's, there's a question from some fellow named James Caesar that you might know. Um, he says, and I'll have to embody him, I suppose. John, what about Katrina in Louisiana? Bush was punished and pilloried for not stepping in and taking over, as he finally did. People wanted president and Fe the president and FEMA to step in. Bush's presidency was destroyed by his reticence. Yeah, let me take that opportunity to, to, to pick up on the accountability issue that we mentioned earlier. It is, I, I would claim that this is the, the chief problem with a federal system of shared power among federal, state, and local governments. And that is that once you disperse power, you allow different officials to have a role in responding to crisis. And then you leave it to the citizens to decide, who do I reward? Or who do I blame in this situation? It's very difficult for the average citizen to actually be able to, to kind of pinpoint, oh, it was the mayor that made this, uh, this, this problematic decision. The governor was going the right direction, but it was the mayor that made the problem. Or, well, the president was going the right way, but my real concern was with the governor who wouldn't follow the president. That's a real difficult uh, enterprise under any circumstances, even for people who are really immersed in the details of this, let alone people who may not be paying much attention or being only kind of paying intermittent attention. Here's what we find from the research. The research shows that the less kind of a politically involved, interested, sophisticated you are, that who do you blame or reward? You blame or reward the president. For people who are only kind of uh, uh, casually invested in the political system, in your view, who is the key actor in U.S. politics? It's the president. If things are going well in response to, to a crisis, you, you, you say, well, the president must have done well. If things aren't going well, you say, well, the president must not have done well. It's some more sophisticated uh, uh, kind of political uh, uh, folks involved politically are better able, research has shown, to be able to parse out responsibility and to be able to say, well, actually, the things didn't go well, but the president was doing, doing a good thing. It's just that the mayor wasn't doing well. And, and we see that particularly Katrina is that Katrina, we, we actually kind of show is that when people tried to say who's responsible for this, the more sophisticated, knowledgeable people were, were more likely to apportion responsibility and blame. Um, less so, people say, I'm putting it all on the president. Uh, that's a challenge of the federal system. It's a challenge of a federal system in ordinary times, even we're just talking about how well an economy is going or how well unemployment checks are being given out. Who do you hold accountable for that? I would say it's, it's particularly heightened concern when you get to a crisis situation in terms of how you actually truly apportion responsibility and blame. And that makes it very difficult because a truly functioning system ought to make sure that people doing a good job are rewarded for doing that good job and people aren't doing such a good job aren't rewarded. It's difficult to do that in a federal system and we'll just have to say when you're adding up the pluses and minuses on the very side of the ledger of a federal system, that has to be seen as one of the challenges. Yeah, I wonder just briefly if, I mean, it's always, it seems to me Katrina's the example 
it's always beneficial for a president to be more aggressive than the law might allow in terms of federal questions. You know, because you'll often hear Bush defenders say, well, it was the fault of the mayor or the fault of the governor of Louisiana, which there's some, there's truth to that. And yet, you know, Bush wasn't someone who generally paid that much attention to legal statutes uh, when it came to exercising his power. So it, it just seems to me, what's striking actually in this case is that the president isn't doing that. It, you know, get back to my first question. I, it's really striking that in this case, again, presidents are deferring power rather than being aggressive. So, because to the extent that the people hold them responsible for the exercise of power, you'd think they would exercise it. So, anyway. Um, no, point well taken a, a, about the responsibility. But but I would go, go back to a point that, that, that I was making some up before, that is presidents might want to exercise more responsibility, and yet they are limited in the amount of actual responsibility they can exercise. I mean, at a certain point, President Trump really did want to say, I have total authority, as he famously said, in a way that led to the Tenth Amendment trending on social media in a way that we usually don't expect the Tenth Amendment to be trending on social media. I think it was a top five I saw, maybe even got up to the top three. You know, what does it take to get the Tenth Amendment to actually be kind of a major topic of discussion on Twitter? If it takes President Trump saying the opposite to kind of lead people to kind of embrace the Tenth Amendment, well, that's, that's what it takes to kind of get a discussion about federalism in, in this country. Um, but I, I think to, to get to my point, though, the president really did it, well, at some point want to exercise responsibility and, and said this at times. He said, I, I, I'll tell governors when they can reopen, he said. And then presumably had discussion with others in his cabinet, others advisors, and folks said, I, actually, you don't have that power. So as much as you might want to do so, it's not yours. And so in the end, presidents do run up just as President Bush ran up in the Katrina response to actually the limits of presidential power in the U.S. federal system, even in disaster response. Do we have time for one more question, Tom? Do you have another? Yeah, one? Uh, I'll, I'll ask another question, and we'll also put up the poll again that we put up at the beginning to see if your persuasive powers were so strong that you moved anyone in one direction. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but um, so as we're talking about apportioning responsibility, I am to blame for not being able to ask all these questions. So I'm going to pick another one that I think um, um, so that you something you didn't address, I think, in any way. Um, so Garrett Jones asks, what are the historical merits to judicial review in crisis time and handling clashes between legislative and executive claims to power, i.e. the Wisconsin Supreme Court? Yeah. I mean, I, I think um, if we look at the, at the federal level and we say how many times has, has, have courts actually stood up against presidential exercise of emergency power? Well, we could find a few cases in the Civil War, but if we actually ask, see if any of these decisions were actually meaningful and actually kind of uh, uh, restraining President Lincoln's exercise, uh, or, uh, we, uh, not so much. Um, where would we point to on the, on the federal level? The leading case clearly would be the Youngstown decision of 1952, where President Truman really did want to nationalize the steel mills. He tried to do so, and he was stopped from doing so by the U.S. Supreme Court. That still stands out as the leading case of in a crisis situation, a wartime situation, in which a president wanted to do something, and a Supreme Court told him no. You might add to that some cases under President George W. Bush in certain of his cases in his response to the war on terrorism, where he wanted to handle trials in certain way, he wanted to handle detainees in certain ways, and the Supreme Court on the margin said, no, you can't do that. But my point here is there's not much. We don't have a long list of occasions where the Supreme Court has stood against a president in crisis times. At the state level, we also don't have a, a long list and that's actually what makes the Wisconsin Supreme Court decision particularly notable. This was a situation in which you had a gubernatorial administration saying, in our view, the health crisis requires shutdown of various kind, and that's our order. And you had a state Supreme Court standing against 
the gubernatorial administration saying, I'm sorry, you can't do this, or at least you didn't follow proper procedure. Now, they left an opening for by which the governor could come back and reissue those orders following proper procedure. But as we learned this week, the governor threw up his hands and said, I'm no longer going to pursue that route. So that's a notable case in which a state Supreme Court has actually stood against a governor and a gubernatorial administration in a pretty significant crisis. We don't have a long list of that, though. Um, in a polarized era, it's perhaps noting, as I tried to emphasize, that we have a different party in control of the Wisconsin Supreme Court as we have in control of the gubernatorial administration. So in those rare cases, um, can, can you actually see a kind of a, a court standing against a, a, a gubernatorial administration? It's rare though. Okay, um, so just to, to make a, one comment, we have 80%, 7% uh, still trusting state government for than more than uh, federal government, which is close to the beginning. I mean, that's an interesting fact in itself, maybe, that uh, that's how things stand. Um, that's higher than the beginning, right? What's that? Isn't slightly that percentage higher. higher than the beginning, slightly higher? Slightly, well, well, though, if someone left or, or came later, then it's no. difficult to judge exactly. This is not a scientific <laughs> poll, unfortunately. <laughs> but in any case. Yeah. Uh, in either case, people were uh, in favor of the state government. Um, so we're running up against our time. I don't know if you have any final remarks. Otherwise, I'll, I'll wrap it up for us. Um, well, I want to thank you both for, for th this very interesting discussion. I want to thank everyone for coming and sending in your questions and also apologizing that we were not able to get to so many of them. But it's always better to leave people wanting more than uh, uh, leaving early, wishing we had ended earlier, I suppose. Um, so uh, one final word about the Jack Mel Miller Center. Um, I've said at the beginning that we are funding programs. We're going to continue to fund programs. Um, we have a call for grant proposals that went out in our last uh, newsletter. If you want to hear about that, you should send me or someone at JMC an email. Um, we're also going to be uh, hiring someone to be working with our academic programming. And if you sign up for our newsletter, you'll be hearing that about that uh, shortly. Um, so I guess that that sums everything up. I want to thank you both again um, and and see all of you watching some other time in person, hopefully. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Tom.